I was going to break it up into pieces anyway. I guess I'm going to re-record the front end. Okay. Sorry about that. What's that? So what do we got for numbers? Okay, 31. Other people got a 14-17 split between female and male? Anybody got a student staff breakdown? Um, 14 and 17. Anybody else get 23 students? That's what we, uh, that's what I'm asking. That doesn't add up to 20, 31, though. How many? Okay, it sounds like the consensus is leaning towards nine staff and 22 students. Okay, hang on to those numbers. We will come back to them. Looks like 22 and 9 and 14 and 17 for the genders. What, one of the things you got to do for this lab that is probably the one that people have the most trouble with is you got to show how this disease progressed through time. This is something epidemiologists do all the time. Is It's called an epidemic curve. And it goes back to a time when they didn't have graphing calculators. They had a clipboard and a piece of graph paper and they would just put people on it and look for the pattern. Now these are three different patterns that you get in outbreaks. You get one where you get a little outbreak, a gap, bigger group, a tiny gap, and then a big group that keep, just keeps going and going. What kind of disease is this? What kind of disease gives you exponential growth? Hmm? Well, yeah, but what kind of disease is it? Just in general. Well, viral would be a type of this kind of disease. Could be bacterial. Hey, we're dealing with one of these in the world. Well, no, it doesn't have to be a pandemic to follow this type of, of uh, curve. This could be a very local curve. But coronavirus is one of these types of diseases. And it's one of those things where if I get to tell you, everybody in the room is going to go, of course. Nobody? It's contagious. You got a case? 
maybe, maybe this is a little cluster of cases. Maybe it's a single case. You've got an incubation period where they spread it to other people. Here's the other people. They're starting to spread it. And then it's starting to take over the population at large. In a real world, you would eventually run out of people to infect and it would drop off, but it would take a while. And if people were dying from this, it would be a bad idea to go that way. Now this is, we've taken our timeline and broken it up. Now the timeline is something you have to decide how to break up. This could be days, this could be weeks, this could be hours if something acted really quickly. This could be individual cases or tens of cases or hundreds of cases. But here's an outbreak where it all happened in the same block of time. And nothing seems to have come before it and nothing seems to have come after it. So this doesn't look to be contagious. But it looks like it all came from the same source. Maybe there was a chemical spill. No. Maybe the water got contaminated. You know, the local water got contaminated. So this is, looks like a non-contagious single source outbreak. And sometimes this spreads a little bit too. It, does, it doesn't always look this neat. And then you get other ones that are just really weird where some poor epidemiologist is trying to figure out what's happening on these days that's producing the cases because it doesn't look like it's contagious. It isn't. It may be the same thing, but it's not the same thing on the same day. And then it's a matter of, you know, what the heck is going on here? You're going to make up one of these curves. Look at the very back of the lab. You have the world's cheapest graph paper. And what you're going to do is make up an epidemic curve where across the bottom you've got your timeline. Going up you've got cases and in this case we don't have that many cases so this would be individual cases. You don't have graph paper on the back of yours? Uh, uh, yeah. Now here's a really important thing. How do you break your time up into pieces? If every block here was a week, all 31 cases would happen in the same week. We want to get a little bit more data than that. We want to stretch our week out. And then it's a matter of, do we stretch it out into days? Do we stretch it out into half days? Do we stretch it out? If we stretch it out into hours, it'll smear the data. You won't be able to see anything. Now, I'm going to purposely pick time blocks that are just a little bit too big. So I'll show you how to do this, but you're going to have to do it with slightly smaller time blocks. I'm going to pick half days. Now, in order to do half days, I get a time. I get to get everybody on here. When did our first case happen? Which one is more important if you're tracking a disease, right? If you if you do the first column, you'll get a very nice timeline for when the infirmary is open. We want the onset. So, when was the first case? Okay, so it was the 16th. I'm going to start here. And if I'm going to do half days here, I'm going to do midnight to noon to midnight. And ours was morning of the 16th, right? It goes on here as a box. And I'm just going to keep it. Uh, how far am I going with this? When was our last case? So let's see. Here's the... Um, up. I screwed this up. Well... So I at least got to get the afternoon or the uh, evening of the 19th on here because that, those are our cases. If I were doing this for real, I'd make it a little wider because who knows, we may run into more cases as we're putting this together. And that's why people design this to have boxes on it. So that if a new case came in, you wouldn't have to erase everything. You could just add a box to the cases you already have. So when's our second case? A.M. or P.M.? Okay, next one. Same day at 6 p.m. Next one. Same day at 7 p.m. There's two cases actually at 7 p.m. 
Okay, so now we start to pile the boxes. Next one. Next one. Next one. Everybody see how I'm putting this together? As long as a case occurs in this 12-hour period, they get to be a box piled on the other boxes. The only time it gets tricky is if somebody got the onset was noon or midnight, and then you would just decide which side of the line to put them on. Right? You wouldn't straddle the line with it. So if I were to do this whole thing, how many boxes would be up here? 31, because we got 31 cases. That's one of the things I'm going to look at when I look at your curve. Now, men remember I mentioned these are too big? You don't get a great curve with 12-hour blocks. 10-hour blocks work. 8-hour blocks work, and it's way easier to cut a day into 8-hour blocks. Six-hour blocks work okay. Four-hour blocks are too small. So you have your choice of six, eight, or ten-hour blocks. Don't use my twelves. But you're going to build it the same way. If somebody got sick during you know, your eight-hour block, a box goes on it. You've got another one, another box, another box. And you get eventually you'll have 31 boxes on here. We will come back and put a mark on this curve. Everybody forgets to do that. I'll remind you when the time comes. So now we're going back to page two. Number one was the epidemic curve that I just talked about. Since I'm lazy and I'm not going to do the whole thing, I get to tell you what, what the curve is going to look like. Because right now it kind of looks contagious, doesn't it? Except what's going to happen when you build this, it's going to peak, it's going to drop, it's going to die is it's not going to, this is not being passed on to other people. So this is not an epidemic that's contagious. So for question two, this is a single source, non-contagious epidemic. That's your answer to question two. So write that down. Hmm? Single source, non-contagious. So you got a calculator? Alex? Oh, no. I didn't phone. Well, you know, yeah, phones, phone calculators will work for the little bit of calculating we got to do. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Question three. What percentage of sick people are male? You know how to do this? So divide male by total? Divide the number of males by the total number. Divide the smaller number by the bigger number. There's 14 males, right? Um, no, it's males. 17, oh, 17 males. males. Oh, okay. 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 Divide by 1,000. Divide by 1,000. Divide by 1,000. Divide by Just take it to the nearest percentage. So 55%. Okay, so our sick group is 55% male, which leaves them what to be female? Uh, 45. Right, that's going to add up to 100. That is the third part of the question. The percentage is significant. Uh, not really. They're too close to each other to make their. It's not large enough of a sample. Okay, does everybody agree that the percentages don't mean anything? The last part of this question, are the percentages significant? How do you tell? Okay, what if our sick group was 55% male and this was a girl's school? Would that be significant? Yeah. What do we need to know? We need to know how the numbers compare to the school, right? What's the, the breakdown for male, female at the school? Look up the page. Not that page, this page. How many males do we have on this campus? Okay, everybody see how she did that? Yeah. Except she's wrong, isn't she? That's how many male students there are. Right. You got to add those two. So how many males are there? There's 130 males out of 202 between the students and staff. We have 130 male students and 72 male staff. And these are numbers you're going to want to write in the margins because we're going to use these numbers again. So we have 202 males out of how many total people?
Okay, total of 384 people. So we're back to your calculator. Divide 202 by 384. Okay, other people getting 53% for the whole school? Okay, so this is even closer than we realized. The school's about 53% male. The sick group is about 55% male. So this seems to have hit them as an equal opportunity attacker as far as gender is concerned. And you go, well, that doesn't mean anything. Is this going to be bathrooms? No. No, because bathrooms are gendered, right? It probably, depending on how their housing is set up, it's probably, if they have male and female dorms separate, it's probably not going to be a dorm. So it does give us some clues. If this is a typical campus, it is probably whatever phys ed facilities they have. It's probably not that, because that tends to attract a lot more males in the off hours than females. You know, so there is some clue there. Huh. Everybody has to eat, so they incorporate it to the cafeteria. It is possible. You're, ahead of, you're getting ahead of us. Next question. What percentage of sick people are students, and what percentage of sick people are staff? So how many sick students do we have? So we have 139. That's not how many sick students we have. We have 31. 31. That's how, that's how many people. Oh, right. 22. Right. <laughs> 22. 22 six students out of how many students? Out of students? Yeah, 78 248 students. And when you do the math, what percentage is that? That is about 52%. Anybody else get 52%? Wrong um, numbers. What are we doing? Yeah, okay, I'm just, I read the question. I'm just looking okay, the how many six students do we have? We have 22. 22, 22. Out of 248. Uh, Yeah, it's something. Something's not working right here. Oh, no, it's 22 out of 31. That's the percentage of sick people that are students, right? The number of sick people is 31. The number of students is 22. There's your percentage. So divide 22 by 31. That's okay. I got myself confused, too. Okay, so that's about 71%. Now we've got to compare it to the pr pro proportion on the campus. Now we've got our 248 out of 384. 248 students out of 384 people. I'm so confused when yeah. my numbers are coming from. <laughs> like I have my whole brain is all messed up. What we're doing is we're comparing the proportion of six students to the proportion of students on the campus out of all the people. 384. Yeah. So do 248 divided by 384. 248, number of students, divided by 384, number of people. So about 65%. So is that a big enough difference for it to mean something? I got a no. I got a yes. You're both right. We, it's, it's big enough that may, it might mean something. It's small enough that it might not mean something. It's a small sample size. Also, anybody got a reason why the staff might be underreported? You're a staff member on the school and you get sick. Where are you going? You might be going home. Yeah, especially if you weren't super, super sick. I mean, even if the infirmary is where you're supposed to go, maybe you went to see your own doctor. If we had one staff member sick who didn't show up at the infirmary, that would skew the numbers closer to the proportion for the school, right? Yeah. So probably 
it, it might mean something, it might not. You don't want to forget about it, but you don't want to necessarily push it that way either. There's another way to look at the numbers, and this is what um, epidemiologists love. They love attack rates. An attack rate is a... Mi I'm what, sorry. I'm sorry to be rude, but I no, that's the answer for the percentage uh, significance. I didn't, I didn't catch the answer. Okay. We decided that the sick group was 71% students. Right. On a campus, that's about 65% students. Okay. And then it's a matter of, does that mean anything? Okay. The numbers don't quite match up, but they're not that far off. Okay. That's why a yes or a no, neither one of those is a wrong decision on this. The percentage of sick people that are students is 71%. Okay. Seven, uh, that's 22 out of 31. That's how you get the 71%. Uh, the, um, the campus is about 53%. Okay. Yep. For that, that's for the male-female. She had missed that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's another way you can compare groups. And this is basically a risk assessment. Like if you wanted to know what the attack rate was for males, how many sick males do we have? How many males are on this campus? Is it is it 202? So what was your risk? If you're male on this campus, what's your risk of being sick? Well, 17 out of the 202 males were sick. That's your risk. Give me a percentage. Take it to a tenth on this one. So what's that in percentages? 8 point. Okay, other people getting 8.4? And we've got 14 females out of how many females? What was the risk if you were a female on this campus? So the risk to the males and females is within a percentage point. So it still doesn't look like a male-female thing. We can look at students and staff this way, too. we got 22 students, right? How many students on campus? And we've got, what, nine staff? Out of how many staff? Hundred and thirty zero? One three eight zero? Ah, one three six. And whenever you do something like that, you do what's called a baseline, which is thirty one sick people out of three hundred and eighty four that are the total number of people on campus. Which should fall between these numbers most of the time. Okay. Anybody rethinking the student staff stuff? And it's still just over 3% difference. But you could also make a case for the student risk being about uh, half a, a, you know, one and a half times the, the staff risk. So it's, it gives you another way of looking at the numbers. There's no right or wrong answer here. And so does it look like a group has a particularly higher risk if you decide, yeah, the students do, that's an okay. But it's not so high that it's absolutely a right or a wrong answer.